No way I'll ever forget the nostalgia behind that startup. Musashi X here, and welcome to the debut episode of my Top 20 Countdown. Or, as you see in the title of my video, what could have been a Top 20 Countdown. Well, first off, why Top 20? Well, the better question is, why give 10 reasons for a subject matter when you can double down? However, given today's subject matter, the upcoming PlayStation Classic, I feel like having a Top 20 is not going to be enough. The PlayStation Classic comes with 20 games built into the console, and while many players would find the list underwhelming, myself included, at the same time, I really don't mind the list too much as I grew up and loved playing the vast majority of them, with only a few of them being more missed than hits. Not to mention, it all comes down to licensing and royalties which are not as cheap as you think they are, as I've discussed it on my Real Talk video. Now I'm still gonna keep my PlayStation Classic pre-order active, if only because well, sooner or later, somebody's gonna find a way to actually mod the heck out of the thing, the same way a lot of people already did with the NES and SNES classics. Now that we know that the PS Classic will be running on an open source emulator based off of the PCSX on PC. And after looking at Dreamcast Guy's top 10 video on games that should have been on the PS Classic, I figured I would do the same thing, only more robust. And like I said, Top 20 is not going to be enough. So for this countdown, I'll be naming my top 40 PS1 games that should have been on the PS Classic or will eventually be modded in. And we're going to start it off with numbers 21 to 40. I'm Musashi X, and welcome to the debut episode of my countdown. The countdown that I like to call, Top of the Game Chain. Just for a little disclaimer before we begin, Castlevania Symphony of the Night will not be on the list whatsoever if only because, as much as we want that game, it's already been re-released on the PS4 via Castlevania Requiem. And any Crash or Spyro games will not be on the list either if only because of their remasters and only Activision has to say whether or not it's going to be on the PS Classic. But then again, it's going to get modded eventually, so demand for these games are very much done to death. Also. Sequels and prequels of existing games will be accounted for, and imported games from other nations will also be considered. Especially when there's a lot of games in Japan that are actually worth playing in my books. Let's begin with something scary and suspenseful at number 40. Alone in the Dark was one of the very first survival horror games, and then some years later, Resident Evil would hit the scene and make the genre mainstream. While Resident Evil 2 or 3 would have been easy selections for this countdown, and yes, I'm sure those will eventually be modded in, we'll start it off with the sister game, Dino Crisis. Consider it Resident Evil cross Jurassic Park, but it goes deeper than what you think. You play as Regina, an agent sent to investigate the ruins of a research facility in search of a scientist that was speculated to have died. However, she and her team discovered that the staff at the facility had been eviscerated by dinosaurs. Like Resident Evil, Dino Crisis has you trying to survive the facility with only limited help and ammunition, forcing you to consider running away and saving what little supplies you have until a certain point when you need to use them. You also pick up key items that you'll need to progress through the game, and while some are simple as attaching them, some would require some forethought as some might trigger something that forces you to think fast, much like in Resident Evil. What makes this game so advanced is that aside from conserving your supplies, you'll also have to use the environment to your advantage by turning on barriers, allowing protection and escape. Unlike Resident Evil, with enough force from a dinosaur, you can also lose your weapon and must be retrieved to survive, as well as deal with quick time events on situations that you simply can't escape from. This level of suspense is so good, it's a shame that the third game on the Xbox killed the series outright as it had nothing to do with the canon storyline. Heck, right after Resident Evil 4 and the sudden cancellation of Silent Hills, the survival horror genre is very much, like the genre itself, a dead genre until Resident Evil 7 got the genre back to its former glory. So if you're planning on adding in Resident Evil 2 or 3 into the classic, be sure to include Dino Crisis because the gameplay and atmosphere is very intense like the horror genre should be, and it'll definitely want you coming back for more.
When you think of puzzle games, immediately that comes to mind is something simple like Tetris, which is still an addicting game even to this day. It's great to see Intelligent Cube and Puzzle Fighter making the PS Classic list, but one game series that should also make the cut would be the Busta Move series, also known as Puzzle Bobble in the East, specifically the fourth game. If you're not familiar, the goal of the game is that you must pop all the colored bubbles in the field without having a single bubble touch the failure line or else the game ends. And the more turns used, the ceiling will eventually dip down, thereby increasing the challenge. There are plenty of modes to enjoy, such as puzzle mode where you select a stage in a triangle, allowing for multiple routes and different challenges to beat the game, or what I consider the selling point, which is the versus mode, where you select a character with their own bubble counter attack layout. Unlike past games, the game's versus mode is more streamlined, thanks to the chain reaction system, which causes drop bubbles to home in, in another line of bubbles on an open gap, causing more bubbles to drop, while also counterattack with more bubbles on your opponent to make the situation more daunting. Out of all the games in the series, Buster Move 4 is a must-need on your PS1 lineup, and its multiplayer is just as fun as playing a fighting game, only without the fisticuffs involved. So, check it out! I usually am not a fan of first-person shooters, but I have played some games in the genre, mostly the old-school kind like Wolfenstein, Doom, Quake, or Duke Nukem 3D. Come get some, baby. However, there is one FPS that deserves a spot on the PS Classic, so I'm throwing in Disruptor at number 38. This is the very first game done by Insomniac Games, the guys who brought us the first three Spyro the Dragon games before it was bought out by various different companies, the Resistance series, which is another good FPS, the beloved Ratchet & Clank series, and one of the best PS4 games, Marvel's Spider-Man. While essentially a Doom clone, it does have a gimmick that makes it original. You have the ability to perform 5 different types of psionics that will help you on your missions, and these psionics can be used to increase your power in conjunction with the weapons you use, or protect yourself from a sticky situation. For a PS1 title and an early game from Insomniac, the graphics of the levels are clean and well designed, and I definitely got a kick of using the various weapons in the game. And Insomniac sure has a way of making guns fun to use in their games. The way I see it, I think this would have been a better replacement for Rainbow Six, as this game is one of the many Doom clones that is sadly overlooked. As someone born in the mid-80s, I've been exposed to many arcade games growing up, specifically those from Namco and Konami, and when I got my NES, I find myself playing those games in my own home, which is a wonderful time. I play so much of Galaga and Pac-Man and I still do to this day, which really made me a fan of Namco, and that's why the Namco Museum takes the spot. I know you're thinking that there's no reason to have old school games in the PS Classic, but it must be understood that during the earlier years of the PS1, Namco has contributed so many of their games to that system, like Ridge Racer and Tekken, the latter of which had a short game of Galaga before the main game. Not to mention, while these games are near-perfect arcade ports, it can't be denied that these emulated games run exceptionally well, and playing them with a PS1 controller is actually quite fun and smooth which is more than anyone can say about those dedicated consoles made by At Games. Goodness, we hate those guys. What's interesting about the Namco Museum is that in Museum Mode, you control Pac-Man in a first-person view, and you get to go inside various different game sections, looking at the exhibits and learning the game's history and how to play them. The information may be limited, but they're still a nice read. It's also cool to see the game room of each game section as you see colorful and nicely drawn graphics of the game field that fits the theme of the game in question, as well as seeing the 3D models of the arcade cabinet or tabletop of the game you're about to play, which is a nice touch. I think out of the five Namco Museum games, Volume 1 is considered the most popular given that it has Galaga, Pac-Man, Rally X, Pole Position, and Vascodian right from the get-go. But either way, the Namco Museum, if you can get all 5 volumes, they're definitely worth modding into the classic. Here's an obscure Square Enix game. Yeah, I know I put Squaresoft in the description, but I'm calling it as such, so don't judge. The Overlooked Vagrant Story. You play as an agent named Ashley Riot, a member of the Valendia Knights of the Peace, who was sent to apprehend a cult leader while solving a murder case that Ashley was accused of from the start. 
You are mostly playing within the ruins and catacombs of the town Ashley was sent to investigate, so in a sense, it's a dungeon crawler RPG, as you don't have any towns to visit or any people to interact with, and you'll find yourself modifying your equipment on some designated workshops in order to survive in the game. The game uses a possible combat system reminiscent of the first Parasite Eve, as you can have Ashley attack a specific limb of an enemy to deal damage, and you perform a series of button presses to achieve good combo strings. But no matter how accurate you do so, you also have to be aware of his risk meter, as your accuracy and defense depend on how much risk you're gathering, forcing you to think twice and back off from constantly attacking. Pardon the pun, it's mostly risk versus reward. However, unlike traditional RPGs, you don't gain any experience whatsoever as the stats you gained or HP and MP you build depends on the equipment you set up or modifying your armor and weaponry. The graphics are nicely done, giving the setting plus the situation Ashley is in solving the mystery, and the suspenseful audio goes well with the overall atmosphere. This is one game from Square Enix that I think is worth trying out. And here we have another obscure Square Enix game and a fighting game at that. Tobol 2, the sequel to Tobol No. 1, and unlike the first game, this game is sadly Japan exclusive, although I'm playing it with an English patch applied to the ROM, but I do have the original copy on hand. If you played the first game, then the gameplay should be familiar. It's a 3D fighter similar to that of Tekken or Virtual Fighter, with a mechanic to strafe from either side to avoid attacks. And just like Virtual Fighter or Soul Calibur, Conditions for victory can either be by knockout or ring out. Unlike the first game, characters can launch projectiles at the cost of some HP, and the strength and impact depends on how long the button is held upon inputting the command, allowing for another way to win matches. The quest mode from Tobol 1 has returned, however it's more improved as you now have a hub world to explore, interact with NPCs, and buy some supplies that you'll need before heading to the dungeon. Once you enter the dungeon, you'll be taking on various types of monsters in each floor and they drop some items upon defeat, some beneficial, some hazardous. And as you descend each floor, some monsters get tougher that you have to be quick on your inputs to get through. I've had so much fun playing this game during the late 90s, what with the great design on the graphics of the characters and stages, especially when the design is done by Akira Toriyama, a more streamlined fighting system, a quest mode more forgiving than the last, the game running at a smooth 60 frames, and such a great soundtrack makes for one delightful experience. This game was supposed to be released in the US, but sadly stayed in Japan, with some sources saying that it's due to low sales of the first game, and those that bought the first game only did so for the Final Fantasy VII demo, not appreciating the game for what it tried to show us. Tobol 2 is not really that expensive to buy, mostly less than 20 bucks on eBay, so I'd say check the game out, make a backup copy, and apply the English patch before you mod it into the system. Take it from me, you'll definitely have a fun time with this game. It's great to see the original Twisted Metal make the lineup, but if anything, I would definitely add in Twisted Metal 2, which to me is the best of the PS1 Twisted Metal series. Twisted Metal 2 now takes the destruction all over the globe, not just Los Angeles like the first game. You'll be doing some damage in New York, France, Brazil, Netherlands, or Russia, but the rules are the same. You're still selecting a card to take into battle, and destroy other contestants to be the last player standing in hopes of getting a wish granted from Calypso, the organizer of the tournament. Each car is armed with machine guns with infinite ammo, and you'll be picking up various types of ballistics on the field that you can use to defeat your opponents, whether it be power or homing missiles, and each car has their own signature missiles and abilities. The game also has two different two-player modes. You can either face each other on versus mode, or you can actually work together in the actual campaign, and it was very satisfying to cause mayhem and destruction with another player at your side. Given the destructive nature and atmosphere, the game also has a rock and heavy metal soundtrack not only to fit the overall theme, but each stage would have a medley of songs in heavy metal form, with my favorite being the battlefield in France. As good as Twisted Metal 1 is, Twisted Metal 2 delivers more on the carnage and replay value, and it's a great title to mod inside the PS Classic. I tell you, chaos can be very sweet.
The PlayStation 1 is no stranger to having shoot 'em ups in the console, but did you know that there's one done by Square Enix? Yeah, not many people know they would do a shooter as well, and a good one at that. Coming in at number 33 is Einhander. This is one of the unique shooters in that the graphics are in 2.5D, with stages occasionally having different 3D camera shifts, but your movement is restricted to 2D only. You can select from three different ships to take into battle, and from there, take on waves of enemies that are charging at you before the boss at the end. Basic stuff from the genre, really. What's interesting is that certain types of enemies carry weapons called gun pods, which have varying amounts of power, ammunition, and range depending on the type of gun pod obtained. And you can influence the position of your ship's manipulator arm to fire shots in different angles while also racking in serious points. The game also has a great soundtrack to keep the action intense as it uses different genres like Progressive House and Electronic Techno, reminiscent of games like Streets of Rage. This is one of the few shooters worth having on your PS1 lineup and it's a blast to try out. Give credit where it's due though, as Square Enix, back when they were still Squaresoft at the time, are more than capable than just being RPG developers as they have what it takes to experiment outside their comfort zone. This is one game that should have been in the PS Classic right from the get-go, Medieval. It follows the exploits of a fallen knight named Sir Daniel Fortescue who was killed in battle a century past, but later resurrected, albeit having a jawless skull head, and sets out to save the Kingdom of Galamir, which is under attack by the necromancer Zerok, who came out of hiding, as well as Fortescue trying to redeem himself from his own defeat. As Fortescue, you explore the different locales of Galamir, collecting money to buy weapons to defend yourself, as well as talking to gargoyle heads for some information on how to go about the game. For the most part, you'll spend time hacking and slashing enemies that get in your way, while also using the souls of defeated enemies to fill up a golden chalice from each stage for you to collect, and use them to get more special weapons to help him on his travels, and collecting runes to unlock doors for stage progression en route to Zarok. While it's mostly a repetitive game, it's still a fun classic to play as I do get a kick out of the various weapons I gather as well as the humorous dialogue when some percentage of gargoyle heads in the game love to berate him. It did have a remake on the PlayStation Portable and it was announced this year that a remake of this very title will be coming soon to the PS4. So having this game modded into the PS Classic will be perfect for those that want to try to experience the game for themselves until the PS4 remake is released. Fortescue lives again. If you've seen my Disney Games Marathon, I've stated that aside from Square Enix, Capcom and Sega are two companies that can get Disney games right, and while I still stand by it, there also exists good Disney games not done by the aforementioned companies, one of which is Disney's Hercules. It follows the same story from the film in which Hercules must prove his heroism to the gods in order to gain immortality and his place with his father Zeus and the other gods on Mount Olympus. This game is mostly a 2D side-scrolling platform, armed with a sword, and you can use your fist in battle to complete tasks and enemies, en route to stopping Hades and save Greece. Every once in a while, you'll also run in over-the-shoulder pseudo-3D sections where all you can do is jump and dodge obstacles. Just like the movie, Hercules has to face various villains throughout the whole game, like the Minotaur, the Hydra, and some Titans, just to name a few, and you'll also find some power-ups that can aid him in his quest like Elemental Swords, or heal HP with Herculade. While the graphics of the background are 3D, the sprites are on 2D, and the use of color in the game is very lively, and the soundtrack really conveys the goals that Hercules tries to achieve and the situations he must face. The PS1 has no shortage on 2D platformers, so if you're a fan of both the movie and platformers in general, Hercules is worth having in your collection. And we have another criminally overlooked Square Enix title. This time it's Xenogears, and despite having the prefix Xeno in the title, this game has no relation to Xenosaga despite created by the same producer. The setting and plot of the game has a mix of science fiction with religious symbolism, and whenever an important plot point comes about, they would be presented in a mix of traditional anime art style and pre-rendered CGI. The graphics of the game are fantastic, from the illustrations of the 2D character sprites to the rendering of 3D models of mechs and vehicles, as well as the design of the overworld by having visible structures to explore. This game has two different battle sequences. 
You have your standard battle on foot, in which you use action points to perform different martial arts moves, and if accumulated more, you can unleash powerful combos followed by a finisher called a death blow, which deals high damage to your enemies. Eventually, you'll come to later parts of the game where you can also engage in mech battles, which functions the same way as on foot, but it requires more planning than just rushing head first without realizing what you've done until it's too late. With such a bittersweet tone, a graceful soundtrack, and two battle engines that are understandable, I believe that the PS Classic is definitely in need of this game as it is a very solid game during the near late stages of the PS1. Here's an underrated 2D fighter, Cyberbot's Full Metal Madness. Released only in Japan, it's Street Fighter but with giant robots to pilot and do battle with. You get to choose whatever pilot you like, but the overall gameplay is determined by the armored mech chosen. Each mech type has three different mobile suits with their own strengths and weaknesses, with more that can be unlocked as you progress through each pilot's story. You only have three attack buttons and a dash button, but even then, the controls are very straightforward and easy to manage. It's also cool to experiment with the different mobile suits available as well as the unlockables. Even though the untranslated version is released on the PS3 in the US via the PlayStation Network, this is one fighting game that shouldn't be missed and hey, if you love Rock and Sock'em Robots in Street Fighter form, this game's got you covered. Let's face it, we think ninjas are cool. They're sneaky, they work within the shadows, perform great ninja tricks and maneuvers, and of course, stealth kills. Which is why Tenchu Stealth Assassins is at number 28. You get to control either Rikimaru or Ayame, both ninjas under the employ of the Gota clan, task of assassinating various enemies causing corruption all around Japan. If you've played any Metal Gear game, you know that the name of the game is Stealth. Trying to pass by or take down enemies with little to no weaponry or support on your person, and Tenchu defines that aspect. It's great to make use of the ninja sense on screen, in conjunction with using areas like rooftops to scout the area to ensure that you're in the right moment for the kill, and when you achieve Grandmaster status at each stage, you can try again as many times as you like if you want to restock on that particular ninja item because trust me, in later stages, you'll be needing them. Having just Metal Gear Solid is not enough, so having Tenchu is a good addition for the action stealth genre, especially for those that haven't played the series yet. I enjoyed watching Looney Tunes. Cartoon slapstick comedy at its finest and I still try to find some ways to watch those shorts again. Unlike Disney games, games based on the Looney Tunes are mostly missed and hits no matter the generation. However, from my experiences, there exist good Looney Tunes games such as Bugs Bunny's Crazy Castle, Taz in Escape from Mars, and the game that I know some of you will say that it's a strange pick from me, Bugs Bunny and Taz Time Busters. This game is a follow-up to the previous game, Bugs Bunny Lost in Time, which I'll admit I also like. You control both Bugs Bunny and Taz, and the game is a collectathon, as you'll be going through different eras in time to repair Granny's time regulator by getting the time gem back from Daffy Duck while also collecting gears along the way. Since you're controlling both characters, this game is about having both characters work together and make use of each other's abilities, like Taz's signature spin or Bugs Bunny burrowing underground. Each era will have you testing your platforming skills, while other stages will also have you requiring both characters to solve different puzzles to earn more gears to complete the game, and the way the puzzles and minigames are handled, while simple, are nicely managed. The graphics are good for PS1 standards, and the use of color for the backgrounds and models are vivid to capture the feel of a typical Looney Tunes short. And just like the cartoons, this game makes sure that it captures the comedic slapstick personality that the series is known for. This is one Looney Tunes game to have in your lineup, and if you love cartoons, you'll also find some laughter and fun from this game as well. <laughs> from the beautiful mind of one Hideo Kojima comes this Japan-only overlooked visual novel masterpiece, Police Knots, a spiritual successor to his other masterpiece, Snatcher the latter of which also had a Japanese release on the PS1, just for a little trivia. 
Just like Snatcher, Kojima pays homages to various different movies, take inspirations from key events of said movies, and mold them into one original story, which even to this day was the best method of making such wonderful stories and having characters based from familiar franchises that we've grown to like. The gameplay of Police Nuts, however, is different in that it uses a point-and-click interface in which you move the cursor around the screen to interact and analyze objects or talk with the various characters in the game to gain information in order to progress with the game. Like Snatcher, there will also be some segments where you shoot down enemies to save your skin or solving puzzles in which you have to be very attentive or risk getting a game over. The game makes use of full motion video and the soundtrack is amazing with songs that convey mystery and suspensions of disbelief, while other pieces would bring intensity on whatever situation you come across. Just like Tobol 2, if you manage to get a copy, make a backup ROM and apply the patch. Sometimes a game doesn't need actual gameplay to be a good title and it's this kind of narrative that makes Kojima such an icon and this beautiful gem to me is PS Classic worthy. Even though it's the butchered translated version, it's great to see Persona 1 make the cut on the PS Classic, though it makes me wonder why some, but not all, YouTube game reviewers would express so much disinterest when it made the cut. Let's be clear here, had it not been for Persona 1, no other games in the series would ever be experienced in the Western market and it would not be a series with a huge following that it is today. I enjoyed the first game not only for its plot, especially when it's really dark, which I actually like, but also the mechanic of negotiating with demons for their spell cards to use to create different types of persona to use in battle, and kept experimenting with them until I find the right setup that I can use to decimate any enemy. It really brings a smile to my face. So I think the PS Classic should have also placed Persona 2 as well, and I'm talking about the complete duology, both Innocent Sin and Eternal Punishment. Both games play the same, and the stories of both games have a similar plot point, but through the viewpoint of different characters, but thankfully keeps the setting just as dark. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed Persona 3 and onwards, but Persona 1 and 2 has the better atmosphere. Like the first, you're also fighting demons in a turn-based setting, and the negotiation mechanic is still possible, but has been tweaked to be more complicated than just having one person handling the chat, requiring more forethought. Even more forethought is needed when engaging in conversations in the hub world that might somehow affect the game's landscape when you least expect it. Innocent Sin only stayed in Japan until it finally got a US release on the PS Portable in 2011 due to the World War II imagery later in the game, which is very perplexing, especially when one would consider that games like Wolfenstein would have said imagery, though there exists a fans translated version of it on the PS1. So only Eternal Punishment made stateside and kinda suffered like Shining Force 3 on the Sega Saturn in that the story is incomplete until after the fact. So having both Persona 2 stories are worthy additions to the PS Classic as both Persona 1 and 2 need more attention. Ah, Frogger. That sub game crossing through the highway in a river, trying to occupy five spots and acute sounding music accompanying it. Such fun times with that game. But then Frogger will make a comeback in 1997 with the release of... Well, Frogger. An expansion of the original arcade game, having levels with large maps, 3D rendered graphics and techniques exclusive to this game, such as super hopping to higher ledges, croaking, or use Frogger's tongue to eat flies for points or power-ups. Each map requires you to collect 5 frogs of varying colors, and with this game being an expansion, you'll do more than just crossing highways and logs. You'll also be going through ponds, forest with bees, or a factory just to name a few of the game's various locales. I know it's a strange choice, but I just had to put it on this list as I had a really fun time with it, especially when listening to the updated version of the Frogger theme in the stage aptly named Retro, which is the actual arcade layout in 3D form and it's a joy to see. Say what you want about this game, I know it's an unpopular choice, but I think it's a good enough addition to mod into the PS Classic, and as hard as this game is, every failure I make prompts me to come back to it more, and the replay value makes it worthwhile for me.
We've heard about the PS1 and PS2 Final Fantasy games also coming out to other consoles like the Xbox One, yet for a strange reason, Final Fantasy VIII was left out, which is why I think Final Fantasy VIII deserves to be on the classic. I won't go into full detail as to why the game is omitted, so I suggest watching Dreamcast Guy's video of his FF8 discussion. Just like Final Fantasy VII, this game also has a rich and beautiful world to explore, a soundtrack that is just as epic as its predecessor, and you have iconic characters that we came to know and like. This game also has a great story that is very deep that will also have some twists and turns, and in conjunction, it also tells us how these characters would develop over the course of the story. The battle system feels more like FF7, albeit more tweaked with some different additions, but still simple enough to understand, and this active battle system is just as engaging today as when it first came out. Final Fantasy VIII hasn't really got that much love these days, that I think adding it to the PS Classic would help get the game the spotlight it once had. If anything, aside from adding Final Fantasy VIII, I think it's safe to say that any Final Fantasy game that is on the PS1, as well as the PS1 version of Chrono Trigger, are worth adding to the... PS Classic. Parasite Eve is such a good game that it's basically taking the horror aspect of Resident Evil but turning it into an RPG and worked out so well, though it is baffling to see it show up on the Japanese version of the PS Classic. Still, we could always just mod it in, but why mod just the first game when you could also include the second game as well? Unlike the first game where you have random battles, this one takes the Resident Evil approach with the pre-rendered backgrounds that can shift from different screens, but some of the RPG elements have been retained. The battle system took a drastic change as it no longer has an active time bar to perform any action, making the battles all in real time, giving you the freedom of movement and use any commands to your leisure without any delay in any given situation, very much like Resident Evil. You still get to earn experience points to make yourself stronger and gain more powers, and this game has many unlockables to get. Even though Parasite Eve 2 is considered a Resident Evil clone, that's not really a bad thing as long as the gameplay is functional, and the overall horror feel of the game would give a good scare and adrenaline rush when you step into danger. It's a shame that after the third birthday on the PlayStation Portable, the series would go silent once again, so now would be the right time to try out both Parasite Eve 1 and 2 as they don't disappoint in the slightest. I would have added in Street Fighter Alpha 3 in the list, and as great as that game is, having it in the countdown is almost too easy. While I will find myself having Alpha 3 modded in, I want to make sure another good Capcom 2D fighter joins the fray. In this case, Darkstalkers 3. Unlike Street Fighter or the first two Darkstalkers titles, you're playing one whole round, and whenever you drain one's HP, the round continues with your opponent on full health, while you retain the amount of HP left until you lose a marker yourself, similarly to Killer Instinct. This is very much the complete version of its arcade counterpart as the original arcade omitted 3 characters, but in the PS1 version, you get to try out any of the 18 characters to see what style suits you. Even with some missing animation frames, what matters is the functionality and I'll say that the game is handled well. And even though the Sega Saturn version is better, the PS1 controller works just fine for this fighter. Seeing as how Capcom has placed so much more focus on Street Fighter nowadays, it's sad to see that Darkstalkers hasn't really got that much attention right after 3, despite characters also appearing in crossover games. If you plan on having Street Fighter Alpha 3 in the lineup, be sure to consider adding Darkstalkers 3 as well. The fast-paced fighting engine, the soundtrack, and presentation makes it a fantastic fighter to enjoy with others for some one-on-one -on -one Demon Smackdown. Now this is not the end of the PS1 games countdown folks, so coming soon, we'll be looking at the remaining 20 games that I think should be on the PS1 Classic. From number 20 all the way to my number 1 pick. But what do you think of the list I have so far? Are there any games that you think that deserves to be in the PS Classic? Let me know in the comments section below. And if you like this video, feel free to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell for any upcoming videos coming from me, and don't forget to like and follow me on social media as well. So coming up next on the Basashi X Chronicles, we'll be looking at the remaining 20 games that I think the PS1 Classic should have. Until then, this has been Musashi X, and I bid you all farewell, take care, and stay tuned!